So if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I really want to talk about something, uh, you don't need slides either, right? So we're just encouraging people to stand up and talk about something. It could be a project, it could be a tool, it could be a technique, it could be a policy, uh, it could be your new fan club that has got some link to like, hacking or security. Um, so once we've gone through the, the ones on the list, I'll be asking, there should still be time, I'll be asking you know, if someone wants to come up and talk for five minutes. Uh, and of course, if you only have three minutes of material, that's all right too. So, all right, I think we're ready to go. So uh, first up, Mr. Weisstoffi. So, uh, I'm uh, Casper, and I'm going to talk about uh, Team Dynamics for uh, Fun and Profit. Uh, it's a long talk, but it's uh, adapted. So, who am I? I'm a, a short and medium consultant, so I do systems, and uh, a little bit of security, a little bit of performance, and I've made a couple of tools that have already security uh, firewall. And uh, the passive real time asset protection system, you can check them out. But the point of the, the, this talk is actually that uh, usually my biggest problem at work are people. Uh, I mean, we're all hackers, and uh, it turns out that people are the hardest things to, to um, make uh, adapt to the situation. So I was, I'm here to talk about. Uh, a little bit about uh, how to make that efficient or better. Uh, as someone that didn't turn out, uh, didn't start out as a team player, I ended up um, working really hard on getting um, people to work together. Okay, so I'll do these engagements where I'll, I'll go out to two clients or together with the office people, and it turns out that the dynamics of, of the whole thing needs to be better, right? Uh, so, why teamwork? Well, the purpose of, the, the, of teamwork is to strengthen each other through the dynamics of work and play, okay? So, it's supposed to be fun, right? Uh, we need to talk each other into and out of and through things, and that, and that way we can be better than any single individual. I know there's a lot of hackers here who are really good at what they do, and often they're really good when they just get to do what they're doing and, and then they communicate what, what they've done with people. I'm talking about how to can be better by working together in a group. Right. Um, so we want to be smarter and faster and that's better than an awesome long cowboy. Uh, one a little note on focus. So if you have a little team or a bigger team or you have leaders, salesmen, people like that, Usually they'll come in and say, oh, I've got a little question for you. Or uh, they'll ping you on IRC to check if you're paying attention, and then they'll ask you a question. That's, uh, you gotta mind that your focus stays focused. So as long as you have that, and this is one of the ways of, of uh, building a team well, is, is, is that everybody's responsibility is to keep each other focused. Um, so, the, meta here. so uh, the most effective teams touch base once in a while, maybe every day. They'll ask each other really quickly, what are you doing, where are you going with it, is there a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, do you need anything, can we help, and are there any opportunities for us to do something together. Right? 
and uh, a really good team has some good communication skills actually. So um, they're using some different channels for communicating. And uh, what you're doing, it's if you can't explain it in one minute to me, don't bother, just send me an email, right? Uh, where are you going? Right at the info. Uh, yeah. And we also have this thing, we have a chat, and the point is to not interrupt each other while we're working. To leave a message for somebody so that when they actually have that natural break in, in their workflow, they'll check their messages and then they'll respond to, to, to things. And uh, the best type of communication among hackers is actually source code, right? It, there is nothing better than to exchange source code. Um, also, there is a really important part of, uh, of working together, and that is to, to accept blame if, if there's something that fucks up. To accept blame without necessarily having to be shamed for it. So, it is human to err, and um, if, if uh, you have a type of, kind of culture that allows people to err and that works out why that happened and tries to avoid it the next time, it's so much better than the blame game. Right? So uh, a couple of techniques for that are root cause analysis, you know, the fishbone diagrams on the, on the, on the whiteboard. Uh, but it needs to have all stakeholders in the project after something is coughed up, right? Let's see. Um, and, it, and time's up. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>
expressing my ID, I came up with the JAWS project, which is Java Working Samples. The ID, and what you see here is like a conceptual thing, because the project is still new. So the idea is that we provide to developers a working solution in which you have a good, that's stuff in the green, where they can see a solution that works. And we also have a bad page for each and every solution or question they may have that's been put on the left of the screen. So in case they want to make something that's capable um, not to be injected by SQL injection, they come at the good page where they see how it should be done. They can also go to the bad page where we have, where we will put some attack vectors so they can try it themselves. They see what a SQL injection is. They see what it can do to their application. Then they go to the good and they can try the same attack vectors and see that it's not working anymore. In the project, of course, we will also provide all the testing, so the unit test code, uh, and make sure that the code coverage is not broken. Because you know, a developer, he has certain metrics he has to be able to give to, to the project manager. So if we want to give them a good solution, we, we have to make sure that it doesn't break uh, whatever they have been doing. So the page is created and is up there on the internet. So I welcome you to look at it. For, from this moment, I don't have yet working code, but I have uh, already a team of five developers who are um, working closely to make this thing happen. But of course, any input or working solutions you may have are uh, much welcomed. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Lucas. Uh, I'll talk about DNS amplification, what it is and how it can be avoided. Um, I work for the Big Four. I'm a contributor to securitystackexchange.com and I have a blog at cloudformer.eu. So, what is DNS amplification? Um, it's a distributed uh, denial of service attack which uses flaws in the DNS uh, protocols or architecture. It was used uh, recently, a few months ago, in the attack against Spamhouse, where it generated all, up to 300 gigabits. Um, at that point, Cloudflare said that it was one of the most dangerous attacks ever, but according to the tier one provide, ISP providers, they said like, yeah, there was an increase, but not as dangerous as it would take down the internet. So uh, the reason is, uh, there are a few reasons why uh, the attack is possible. The first one is that uh, the DNS request size versus the DNS response size is uh, quite significant. And that it uses, well, well, the DNS can use UDP, it can use CCD, but for performance wise it's better to use UDP. Uh, the second problem is actually a configuration error by a lot of administrators uh, by allowing open resolving name servers. And because there is also still 20% of all ISPs who don't uh, bother implementing BCP38, which has been around since 2000, and which is solution against most uh, connectionless uh, denial of service attacks. So the first problem is that when you send a DNS request, you use a UDP packet, it's 30 bytes, and the DNS response can go up to 500 bytes. So that means that if you alter the source address to the, so to the address of the person you're trying to attack, you can, uh, so with the 30 bytes, you can send in 500 bytes because you will ask to the uh, the DNS server if, uh, to, re to send a response of 500 bytes to your uh, victim. So if you manage to take like 1 megabit, then you will send 1 megabit to the DNS server. The DNS server will send like almost 17 megabits uh, to the target. 
for the effort. So the effort versus the result is quite large. And that's why it's also called amplification. So the first problem are open resolvers. So open resolvers are DNS servers which allow uh, to be queried from the internet. Uh, there are a few, it's necessary for the internet to work, but a lot of people are not aware that their DNS servers are actually open to the internet. I think for the spam attack, they were using 30,000 open DNS resolvers. Uh, Xavier did the uh, query for Belgium. In Belgium, there were 2,000 open resolvers. Uh, so, as I said, you spoof the UDP source to the target IP address, then you send tons of DNS requests uh, with the spoofed IP address, and then all the servers start sending one uh, like large amounts of data to the uh, victim. The main solution is for every administrator to just not allow recursion from IP addresses from coming from the internet, unless that's really what you meant to do. Uh, the second solution is the best solution, which is BCP38. And it works right before, they're still working for it on IPv6, but cons considering the address space, it might give some issues. Um, it's actually a way where the upstream providers only allow traffic for IPv6 blocks for which their clients are configured for. So if you get a client who wants to send um, I, uh, suddenly from an IP that you don't even own, then you're just going to drop the packet because you know that that's not normal traffic. There might be uh, some uh, uh, situations where this is actually uh, wanted behavior, but those can be filtered. Those can be made, uh, for those you can create an exception. Uh, the biggest problem is that ISPs are already cooperating, but they're not cooperating enough. The whole system on PCP38 is completely on, uh, on relies on how good that your neighbor will help you. So you, they, they both need to do implement it at the same time, or otherwise the problem won't go away. Thank you. Hi, my name is Edwin. Um, as I said, I'm glad it's five minutes because I ate uh, Indian food last night for the first time in my life. So let's make this quick. We have a really quick test of uh, 32 uh, The meaning of life, we always say. Uh, I find it out together with uh, Mr. Klaus. I don't know if you know. He's pretty famous in the Netherlands. And that's me, the other The problem was that we had a, a friend uh, where, uh, who was uh, trying to get Google and didn't reach it. And uh, we did some research and found out that his Google resolved to 42.0.28, which is weird because he had no viruses, etc. So we got like, oh my god, what the fuck is the problem? And uh, we, we of course uh, looked at it and it was China. So, okay, you have a new type of virus. It's not possible to be anything else. We did some more research uh, and uh, Mr. God asked uh, at the Twitter, what's up? resolving of Google to a wrong address. And I looked into it and found that uh, uh, the C um, module, ghettos by name, expected IPv4, uh, not IPv6, and used the first four bytes of the IPv6 address to make a nice IPv4 address, which is pretty scary if you think a bit later on after these five minutes. So what happened is uh, you ping the host on an uh, trip of a quarter A record, and you got back a nice IPv6 address, but it translates the first four bytes back X to this famous 42 address. 
are people beginning to think of beautiful things you can do if you own that address. So uh, we uh, did some checks and updates and someone mentioned that it's a problem in the case of DNS proxy that runs in this case on a Constantronics router, but uh, alas it runs on a lot of more modems, routers, etc. It is pretty old, but yeah, some people never update their uh, internals. And you get shit like this. So you can, if you have a modem which has this problem, you can uh, check it uh, by first trying to pin an IPv6 address. There will be no answer on IPv4. If you then uh, get the AAA address and you try it again, you get a nice address back. And after that, if you ping again, then you get back this beautiful address. So we think, what more can we do? Let's make a small Python script. I'm going to put a Python so you can see flaws and just scream all around a little better. It's somewhere on the internet anyway. But it just gets, uh, tries to find an IPv6 address, resolves it to the wrong IPv4 address just to see where we, where we get again. And we had a, a big list. And in the end, we tried the uh, Alexia top of 1 million uh, domains. And we got back about uh, 45,000 IPv6 addresses. And if we resolve them to the other side, <coughs> we get this. The big one is China. And that's pretty awesome because yeah, most of the IPv6 addresses resolve back to China. But we also have some USA, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Malaysia, etc. We have some split data, it's like the song contest. Give me your points. So if you look at China, it's for 32,000, but USA has 6,001 hits on the IPv4 address. So that means if you have an IP address in the United States with this falls in this category, you can spoof sites. And what we basically would like from you is to help. So we made a small list of addresses we have uh, found, which is on the best pin link. So if you want to come to me or just ping me at this name, you can get the list. And we would like to find an address in that range so we can put some monitoring tools on it and see if, if it's used widely, what we can do with it, how many load modems are there, how many hits are we getting, which aren't supposed to be for those IPv4 addresses. That's it. Thank you. Hello, welcome. My name is Frank Redijk. Uh, these are my credentials, and they are way too fast for you to remember. Um, this is a talk about responsible disclosure. It's not about a talk about good or bad. It's just about my experiences running a responsible disclosure program. If you want to debate it, I uh, want to go into the good or bad. Buy me a beer tonight. Um, I have to start off with a disclaimer, and that's if you want to run a responsible disclosure program, make sure you have your security in order. Really. And I'm not a lawyer. So the good thing about responsible disclosure is that it actually works. And if you look up this address, which I won't do now, uh, you'll actually find out that we forwarded quite a lot of t-shirts and other stuff to people finding vulnerabilities in our infrastructure. The bad thing is that it actually works and I feel like I'm running a t-shirt shop at the moment. Um, there's also almost things that are funny. You know, we try to do a cross-site scripting vulnerability to a photo site that runs a subdomain of ours. And this was one of their replies where they advised us not to try and use JavaScript in the American address book. Um, we had another uh, friend of mine try to do a report to a major telco and he got we asked for a PTP key because he didn't want to spam the internet with this vulnerability and he got asked to put it on an FTP server, which he had to run, um, text the credentials, then put it in a 7 file with a password and text that credential as well. 
uh, which is not a good way to let people approach you. Uh, then obviously you get researchers who found, find our dual factor secure SSL VPN and they say that, well if you guess the username and password um, and you find it, you're in. Uh, please fix it ASAP. And this is the actual screen and the yellow button come out quite well but it says passcode and I wish everybody luck trying to brute force our dual factor authentication. Um, this is also free to Mr. Breno, who's a journalist in the Netherlands, who um, has some, some notes against uh, responsible disclosure. We say it's not absolving you from legal prosecution. Well, dear Breno, hacking is illegal. I cannot do anything to hide you from the law. Um, go influence the law. He also says it's bad that if you do responsible disclosure, that I as a company dictate what you can and cannot do. And my reply to him is, I'm okay for you to check the box on my door. I'm not okay for you to try and set my house on fire. And by the way, Reno, on your big oversight, where's the responsible disclosure cost? So what did I learn? Um, you need to make it clear, if you run this, you need to make it clear to a researcher what he can expect from you and make it clear what you want from them. Uh, it's not the size of the rewards that counts, people will work for t-shirts. Um, shipping booze around the globe is not a good idea, so we took it off our site, or actually only if you visit us and come and get it yourself. And if you want to do it right, it's an awful lot of work. It sounds like security. You will include the clueless, the greedy, and the rude, but you will also encounter really enable people that are time rich and money poor, and they are the ones that make it worth your effort. Thank you. Okay. We next have Tom, who is going to talk about HCV. No slides for this one. It's a concept talk. Concept talk. I'll give it a go anyway. So yeah, are we ready? I'm a G. That'll find it worth anyway. Who is up to this? No. Okay, so uh, my name is Thomas McKenzie. Um, recently I've been doing a lot of research into the new HTTP protocol, HTTP 2.0, um, also known as Speedy, if any of you have heard the word Speedy around. So, to give you an idea of what's been going on, some group of people decided that we've been playing with 1.1 for far too long and we needed to create something that was a little bit faster, or a, a lot faster, and did some, well, I don't know if they decided to do some crazy shit with it, but they're doing some crazy shit with it anyway, so it's, it's pretty cool, but we'll go into it. So, what happened was, is some different companies, Microsoft, Google, they all came up with like a, an implementation of how they wanted um, the next generation of HTTP to work. And HTTP said, right, we're going to write a standard now, and they were looking for, I guess, I, you know, what to do with Facebook um, wrote a paper um, about what what was going on and they said that speedy the speedy implementation that Google have created um, is fairly good. So what's happening is is that HTTP 2.0 is going to be based off speedy and in fact the the draft that's in at the moment is actually a direct copy of the speedy protocol that Google have made. So what are some of the things that Speedy does? Speedy is doing header compression. So um, instead of just sending headers in a normal request, it, they're going to get compressed. Um, I actually thought they were going to get compressed um, only on one side, but it turns out that they're getting compressed on the client side and on the server side. Um, currently, if you use a Speedy client and connect to a Speedy server, um, you shouldn't be able to see your headers being compressed on the client side. Now, the reason for this is, is that they're using uh, Zlib compression and Zlib compression is vulnerable to the crime attack so the, the major browsers have, have turned off compression on the, on, on the client side. Um, one of the most interesting things for me about, um, about HTTP 2.0 is how servers can interact with the clients now. 
So say for example, um, this might be a bad example, but say for example you have a font that you have on your website that is being served from a remote location. What can happen, obviously you, you send a request to get the, the index page, um, the client will get the index page, it will pass the information within the source, in the response, and it will see um, this, this font and it'll go off, get this font, and then you know, load the website. What the server can actually do now is they can send what are known as server hints and server pushes. Um, so a server hint is basically where the server sends a header and says, I suggest that you go and get this file. And the good thing about that is it sees the header before it sees the response body. So it can go and get that font before it's actually started doing anything with the, the actual body of the, you know, the HTTP body. Um, so that, that's pretty cool, it's saying it suggests to go get it. Uh, a server push is actually where the, the server turns around and says, right, go get this file from a remote location and download it so that I can put something nice in your browser. Um, that, that sounds good to me um, because, it, well, I don't know yet, but I, I think I can maybe get them to download things, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so the thing about this new protocol is that it isn't as simple as a request and a response. Like post requests now, there's talk about having it so that they are streams and not just a request. So it's like a, a, a multi-directional stream where you can, ooh, um, where you can, um, <laughs> you can receive and send data at the same time. So that, that's, quite, that's quite interesting, but it, it looks like a binary protocol. So um, if you want to have a look at it, things like burp at the moment don't work and actually I've been finding that intercepting proxies are crashing servers that Speedy is, is running on local servers, not big servers. And um, what, what I had to do was download the dissector for Wireshark, install it in an old, in an old version of Wireshark with an old version of GCC and uh, it was quite difficult, it took me, <laughs> sadly it took me a couple of days but um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll admit to that. Um, and, and yeah, so if you want to have a look at it, um, if you go and Google for Speedy, most of the major players out there, Google, Facebook, Twitter, are using Speedy. Um, and modern browsers now connect over Speedy, you know, in, in general. Um, and it's all SSL. That, that's one of the other things, it's all SSL. And there's also this thing called Quick, I'll be very quickly, this thing called Quick which is basically going to turn around and uh, instead of doing web over TCP, <laughs> instead of doing web over TCP, it's doing web over UDP, which is quite interesting to speed things up as well. Thank you, Tom. Right, next up, we've got Danish who is going to do iOS 7 Summer Games. So anyway, just while he gets set up, we'll uh, Del will keep you entertained. So, if you haven't got slides, when it comes up and says wave on here, that means you need to wave. You need a connection here? I don't have slides, I, I do have uh, a new generation. Uh, one second. So, as, uh, as I said previously, or um, Craig said on my behalf, that uh, my presentation is going to be about iPhones, and I'm currently trying to get this uh, airshare, airshare over to the other <coughs> screen. So, bear with me one second. getting over. Oops. Good. Go. Uh, 
It's a... Uh, Oh, I got why. I think the resolution of the uh, mm. resolution of the of the, uh, of the monitor or of the of the uh, screen is now higher. So, okay, just in case of time, because uh, I'm gonna really run out. I just flip this around and um, I move it to my Mac. So the story is about. I think everybody heard about um, the. Um, Basically, the, um, the iOS lock screen bypasses that have been discovered in the uh, in a few days ago, and uh, I kind of revisited that and I tried to do that myself. I tried to make it a, a bit easier than um, than what the initial uh, discovery was. Um, as you can see, guys, I'm just not sure what's happening. Sorry, I'm right out of five minutes, and I'll display nothing. Because of the resolution. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, now it's small enough. Hopefully, if I transfer it over to the other screen, it's going to be equally small. Could be done with, uh, with all the applications, so the calculator as well as the uh, uh, the stop rack. So I figure it. I'll just use the calculator rack because the published uh, exploit is the other one. Can you let us one in my hands? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. So all I do is I just try to turn this off, and then, uh, and I just go to this. Bypass mode that was discovered. Uh, I can see all these, uh, these items here and how many emails I have. I've got a lot. But what I might be interested in discovering is that I also have an extended access to see the other side. And while some is not going to go through, but I can start asking questions. If any of them responds to the bar, okay, I don't know who that is, I just did this bypass trick, and now he 
Das ist fein Käufer. Okay, um, bear with me on this one. Um, do you know the song of Britney Spears, Hit Me Baby One More Time? Uh, can you sing along with me because my voice is really bad. And just sing along once and then you guys will have to sing it alone and then I'll do something and it'll be funny. And uh, the idea is, so the idea is, oh, oh, who of you is going to the party tonight? Let's go. Oh, nice, okay, that's really good. Right, so the idea is I'm a really, really bad dancer and um, over time I've learned not to dance, you know, like sexy girls do, but I've learned to dance uh, by listening to the lyrics and it really helps and so that's what I'm going to teach you. So, please bear with me and sing or shout or say along the Britney Spears song of Hit Me Baby One More Time, okay? My loneliness is killing me and I, I must confess, I still believe, I still believe, yeah, when I'm not with you, I lose my mind, give me a sign, hit me baby one more time, you'll have to do this louder because I can't sing along this time, okay, are you ready, come on, just shout, you don't have to sing, and you guys are not going to win X Factor, so you know that, so you can't make yourself ridiculous, okay, are you ready,
Well done. So you can have a dance for that later. Are you going to the party, yeah? Excellent. Good. And Alex, you're the last one up, mate. So, uh, Alex is uh, no slides, he's going to talk to us. You've got five minutes, and then the explosions go off. And this one? Yeah. Okay. Alright, so this is uh, kind of an unfinished thought I've got. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, and the unfinished thought is, is uh, I'm going to title it How Mandiant's Marketing is Killing Itself. Um, so there's a Star Trek Next Generation episode. Yeah, I'm showing my age here. Uh, there's a Star Trek episode where you know, they, they actually break the prime directive and they have to have one of the primitives come up on the ship. And, and Picard says, you know, that which we, you know, kind of the, this all looks like magic and craziness to you, but to us, because we know about it, it's kind of common, right? Um, and so what's really interesting is the concept of advanced persistent threat, right? When you think advanced and persistent, what in, deep in your kind of, in, in your gut comes out? What do you think when we think advanced, right? That's a, actually not a rhetorical question. I'm looking for people to work with me here. What's that? Nanotechnology, yes, because the Chinese are in the nanotechnology. No, but seriously, right? What are you thinking? It's good enough to get past our defenses. It's good enough to get past our, just good enough to get past our defenses, right? Because we don't know about it, right? You can think of O days if you, if you go to uh, one of these sorts of, of marketing campaigns, right? Or you look at recently released reports, there's a whole lot of spear phishing stuff in there, right? And the point is this, when you look at these things and you break them down, you can start to identify patterns. And the patterns and behaviors of an attacker is really the knowledge that demystifies the concepts of advanced, right? Because spear phishing is not advanced. You know, HTML is not rocket surgery. Okay, so you can take advanced, you can take common horizontal thread techniques. It's how they're mixed together, it's how they combine them that really gets us into we don't recognize a pattern, we can't see it, and so forth. So, a lot of the silly, silly hype around big data is, is actually somewhat justified. Because the whole deal here, um, and this is something that my organization does really well, the whole deal here is a, you know, storing and identifying the patterns within the data, getting those patterns out, and it's a little more than seven. So when Mandiant releases uh, their reports, what they're giving us is a narrative, what they're giving us is a couple of techniques, and they're talking about them together. And what you can't, what they haven't done for you though, is, is establish it in a usable pattern where you can go through a sim or a large data store and you can say, oh yeah, there's a pattern, I recognize it. It's no, longer ma it's no longer magical, it's no longer mystical. Even if an O-Day is involved, I can now detect and respond very, very quickly. Um, we just had the talk uh, from the, uh, well, the cyber feed guys, right? About how quickly they can detect and resp respond to patterns. So you're, you're detecting and responding to patterns very quickly. So <laughs> when I was do working with Verizon, and doing the data breach report, we came up with an object-oriented model to take those narratives, first the bad guy did this, and then that, there's some privilege, escalation, exfiltration, yada yada, and we object model, and then we could create, with that object model, the actual patterns to go look for the behaviors. Voila. So, if you are willing to give us, and you being vendors, you being governments, you being each other, Right, and information sharing things. If you're willing to give us narratives, if you're willing to give us a same language for creating and establishing those patterns, it's no longer magical, it's no longer mystical, it's no longer advanced, and it doesn't have to be persistent because we know what the common pattern themes are. We can even extrapolate and use machine learning to determine what the probable next patterns are. Anybody here familiar with game theory? Right, handfuls of us, right? You can take whatever rudimentary knowledge we know about game theory, apply it actually very generously, 
within the context of a really large data set, and you can start extrapolating what the next move in horizontal spread might be. So, if we get more reports, if we get more disclosure, right, then we can demystify the marketing so it's not advanced and persistent, and we can just talk about these patterns, those patterns, new patterns, old patterns, probable new patterns. And that's actually knowledge. That's all I got. Uh, Seba, how long have we got the room for? Do we need to switch? Yeah, so no, in that case, no, so we need to vote. Um, sorry. Okay, so thank you to all the people that stood up. That's pretty tough. Uh, I know a number of you, it's your first time, so it's uh, even more nerve-wracking, so well done to everybody. Uh, now we judge you. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is just go through the list of talks. Uh, just put your hands up. Please don't vote more than twice, okay? Like, two should be enough. Uh, if you're really indecisive, you'll miss the voting. Um, we're going to go fairly quickly and we're just going to roughly count how many and then at the end we'll say, okay, who had the most votes and they win the free ticket to BrewCon next year. So let's start with Casper's uh, talk, something awesome, I promise. Okay, next one, launch of a new OS project from Martin. See the OS fanboys in the room. Um, next up, avoiding DNS amplification attacks from Lucas. Okay. Then the curious case of 42020. Whoa, look at that lot. <coughs> Response, sorry, remember two votes. Okay. Uh, responsible disclosure, the good, the bad, and the almost funny. Uh, HTTP 2.0 from Tom. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that's what all the dictators say. Uh, next up. <laughs> so, uh, Danish iOS 7 Summer Games. Okay. Uh, Alex, who just spoke. <coughs> all right. That was everybody, yeah? Oh, Brittany Smith, sorry, you weren't on the list. What's your name? Marie. Marie, okay, Marie. Marie. Um, Marie. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of Brittany fans in the room. Right, so who the biggest? Okay, so. What Yeah, that's right. It's that actually. Um, okay, so the winner was number four, avoiding the DNS amplification attacks. So that goes to Lucas Kaufman. Very good, right, so Lucas, you get a free ticket, mate, for uh, next year's group. So, uh, well done. Very good. He's part of the crew, so he's not really going to benefit very much, but hey, life sucks. Um, <coughs> So, let's just give all the speakers a round of applause. Uh, everybody did a good job. Thanks very much. That's the end of the line.
a full set of hands. So which one? Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah, so we... Oh, yeah, no, but... So it's a full one divided by one. So the first one would have been number two. Check me out. So that would be the two of us. Shock. Yeah, this is, this is awesome, right? We only really had one job there, and that was to make sure we tracked who won. <laughs> so, Tom, uh, great news, mate, it's not you. Um, but no, uh, looks like we got a bit out of sync here, so apologies for that. Uh, so, the crew member who gets in for free next year will still get in for free next year. Uh, but in fact, it was the curious case of 420-2018, who have been putting their hands up for. So, yeah, Edwin, uh, apologies for that, mate. Sorry, I owe you a beer, and he owes you like four. <laughs> yeah, I index from one, apparently, he index, indexes from zero or something like that. <laughs> Holding you up. <laughs>